Many of you are familiar with Fiona Scott, um, who's been a member of the Action uh, for a number of years now. Fiona's going to chair uh, the panel this evening. Another established member of our Action is Scalina, that many of you know from, from Iceland. Um, she was uh, on our training school and has given presentations before, so thank you, Scalina. Uh, I'll actually also ask Scalina to talk tomorrow uh, about her work on the Makey Project, so we're really working hard uh, in this <laughs> session. Um, but I'd obviously especially like to welcome our visitors from afar, so Karen Mercier from Curtin University in Perth, Australia. So she's an expert in STEM education um, and her research has received an award from Western Australia Institute for Educational Research. Uh, she's done a lot of working partnerships with governments, industry, community groups, both nationally and, and internationally. So welcome Karen. Um, so, Eileen Burson uh, is a professor in early childhood in South Florida. So, she's conducted many projects um, on the instructional use of technology and pedagogy, uh, looking at obviously the focus in early years and uh, looking at the affordances of the technologies uh, for young children. So, she's published very widely uh, in the area. Many of you will be familiar with her work. So, welcome, Eileen. Um, Michael Burson. Um, Last but not least, Michael Burson um, is Professor of Social Science Education, also at South Florida, so I welcome Michael. Uh, Michael's work has received international recognition for integrating emerging, emerging technologies um, into instruction and looking at modelling innovative pedagogy. Um, and his work has also been honoured with the National Council for Social Studies President's Award for outstanding contribution to the field. So it's a great honour for us to have these speakers this morning, and I won't hold the panel up uh, any further. So can we uh, welcome them? Thank you, Fiona. Lovely, thank you, Jackie. Um, yeah, so what we're going to do is have about 15, 20 minutes per um, speaker. Um, I'll ask you to uh, hold any sort of really burning questions until the end, then there'll be a chance for a much uh, bigger discussion. Um, but if there are any sort of clarification questions, absolutely feel free to ask those straight away. Um, so absolutely, yeah, I'll uh, kick off with um, Eileen and Michael Burson from the University of South Florida. Excellent. Um, so we're going to kind of give you some very quick foundational information about the work that we're doing um, in this particular arena, but I'm Eileen Burson and Michael Burson, and uh, we'll kind of get right into it. So one of the things that we wanted to sort of situate is the context and the rationale for the work that we're doing. And the introduction of tangible technologies into our early childhood educational context is not driven primarily around the element of um, and not driven primarily around STEM-focused efforts and outcomes, but really about fostering children's critical thinking and problem solving within social contexts. And so that's really sort of the impetus of this work and doing it in a way that connects with their authentic world. So we all know that children within their daily lives are immersed and engaged with a whole variety of forms of technology that they, from the pass back effect of, you know, mom and dad's iPad or iPhone in the car on the way to school or in the shopping um, experience, or even what they're seeing within school and work contexts um, that uh, people around them are utilizing. And so it's sort of making sense of those elements. So that's going to be sort of situating and prefacing uh, the body of work that we're doing. And you can see that these are some of the priorities of our areas of focus. Um, but we're going to connect this also um, with some of our content outcomes that are not, um, so this is content um, free with regard to those sort of desired outcomes. We're going to make um, definitive content content uh, connections. One of the things that's very critical uh, within the context of our implementation is that this isn't about teaching kids about how to use a technology. It's really about teaching children about how to construct and engage in problem solving in collaborative contexts. So this is about constructionism, not technocentrism um, in the work that we do. And a lot of the things that we're doing is um, around the context of play that is seamlessly integrated um, with digital technology, so it's again not about privileging the technology itself. So let's kind of introduce you to what our primary research questions with regard to this body of work. 
One of the things we wanted to explore was how our early childhood educators integrate creative coding into inquiry project investigations in preschool classrooms, and how do young children develop and demonstrate transversal competencies, so that's the computational thinking, creativity, communication, collaboration, when they're playing with tangible coding technologies in their learning environments. And so we're going to introduce you to our lab context, which happens to be our laboratory preschool on our campus at the University of South Florida. And this is our uh, UXF Preschool for Creative Learning. Um, our preschool is driven on an inquiry-based model of instructional approach. And so we teach them based off of a project approach that is driven by children's sort of own areas of inquiry that they are fascinated in. So they come into a classroom, um, they had an experience with a caterpillar as they walked into school, and that could then be the focus of our inquiry that could last for months um, in the context of our classroom. And that's how all of our teachers in the setting are trained. We're very fortunate that our lead educators all have either masters or even are working on their doctoral degrees, that's our lead teachers, and our assistant teachers have had a minimum bachelor's degrees. So um, it's a very highly uh, educated uh, teacher force that we have in our setting. And our director uh, of our setting, who's one of our collaborators, is a, a doctoral graduate of our own uh, program. So she's sort of an extension of our body of our work and our, our research. So let's kind of go to the very beginning um, when the technology comes into our classroom. So we're going to meet Kubeta. So this is the technology that we brought into our classroom. But again, as Eileen mentioned, this is not a very technocentric approach. We let things grow organically in the process. And getting children involved in thinking about a technology was very important to us, not from the standpoint of the technology itself, but from the standpoint of the new friend somebody entering their classroom. So Kubeto is a uh, technology that's come out of the UK as a startup in the past year or two, and uh, it's really an interesting piece of technology because it doesn't have a lot of bells and whistles. It simply makes a few, few little minor buzzing noises, but it's just a block of wood, similar to a block that a child would play with. Notice in the middle, there's a board, and the children eventually called this the brain, where they could engage in moving around tiles as they could code and engage in the coding process. The tiles are color-coded, and the teachers spent a lot of time talking about right, left, movement, and back and forth. And one of the things that Cubeto offered, which was one that was involved in our selection process of this particular tangible technology for introducing our environment, is because it does have the tangible representation of the children's planning. So you can see through this board, so it, it captures sort of their ideas about the movements that they want to elicit for the Kubeto, which is basically just the block itself. So if they, it doesn't do what they planned or intended to, they can easily see how they represented their ideas originally and go back and make changes and modifications. So this is sort of the introduction um, that happened in this classroom with regard to Kubeto. So one of the things you see on Wednesday, we opened Kubeto to observe his brain. Um, they literally took off the box that surrounded the robot itself to see what happens inside of this. So again, this wasn't just drop down technology, start putting some tiles and see what happens. It was trying to make sense about what this thing was that was coming into their classroom. So they took it apart to first understand what it was that it had worked. You know, and this aligns with what we were talking about earlier with this concept of tinkering. Kids will get involved, touch, feel, explore, open up Kubeto and check it out. So they made some observations, and actually you can see it's a little bit faint here, but they actually engaged in observational drawings about what this thing was that they were observing. And so what were some of the salient elements that they had questions about and wanted to know how it worked? Now, of course, whenever you introduce a new friend into an early childhood environment, we want to know what we're going to call that friend. <laughs> and Kubeto just, you know, that wasn't satisfactory. That's sort of what was on the box, but that couldn't possibly be the name of this friend. So the children had a conversation about what they were going to call this new thing that came into their environment. And they didn't know what gender it belonged to, so they really, it was very important, it was a value to them that it had a gender-neutral name. 
So they went through conversations within their myths about what are sort of kinds of gender neutral names that we're familiar with and they problems that we need Harper and Kai and Charlie and so there's all those sorts of things. And of course, in a very democratic classroom that we had, lots of different ideas came forward and they took a vote. And majority won. And so we then, in this particular classroom, then Cubetto became known as Sharky. And Josie so, said Sharky could be a boy or a girl. That's right. So again, we want to know more about our new friends. So not only do what, what do we call our friend, but where did our friend come from? Same question to explore. And so the children were talking about how we, they all lived at that moment in time in the same area, but originally many of the children come from different places. We're a very large university, has a very large uh, international representation of students and faculty from around the world. And so children were exploring the world map and saying, so where did Sharpie come from? And so you can hear from the children's own conversation. Sharky is from his house. And his house is in the block center. And the block center is in our classroom. And it's inside of the preschool. The preschool is at USF. And USF is in Tampa. So the teacher asks, so what city is Sharky from? Tampa, says Alsa. It's very logical sort of thinking. And then Daphne had a different idea. Daphne said, I think Sharky is from Turkey, maybe because he had white skin and because he has brown lips and a brown mouth, I miss my home. So she made a personal connection uh, with Charlie. So you can see that when we're thinking about this, again, not even sort of situating ourselves within sort of the technocentric about what can this technology do, but even just understanding its representation in the context of the classroom, we're hitting a variety of different standards um, that connect with our early learning environment. And I think it's important to note that the, philosoph the philosophical background of the school is around the social justice orientation, so it's valuing voice. And you can see voices coming out in so many different ways, from the naming to the location. And then here, focusing on a house. Cubetto needs a house so he can be safe. We can use bricks and build an adobe house for him. And again, they were just focusing on a unit of homes around the world. So you can see the children bringing in their past experiences of learning. If Cubetto gets wet, we live in Tampa where there's a lot of rain and lightning. Um, if Cubetto gets wet from the rain, he will break. We need to Cubetto Drive, said Hector. Ellison added a clear plastic wrap to the squared window in case it rains. Stefan colored the clear plastic wrap with blue paint and said, I put some blue in the square so it looks like it's raining outside in the window. And so they ended up creating what they called Cubetto's Rainbow House. Um, so this was going to be where Cubetto would live when he was out sort of exploring and playing with them in the context of the classroom. And you know, this really sort of highlighted how children were already associating a means for expression, for sharing, for reflection, and developing their thinking and engaging with the technology. And these are, again, some of um, our standards you can see that are met just through this process as they're sort of creating and designing the house. And it goes into some of these other elements. So, of course, as they're using um, Cubetta within the context of the classroom, not all always goes well, right? Um, whenever you introduce, as we can all experience in our own lives with any sort of form of technology, there'll be big times when things don't quite work the way we thought that they should be. And that happened in the context of our classroom as well. So one day, the children arrived, and they went straight to the block center to begin playing with Sharky. And when they opened Sharky's door, they noticed that he had not been put away properly, as sometimes will happen when there's a quick time for cleanup. So one of the children said, Sharky's upside down. We need to make sure he's working. And they said, let me check the pieces and counted the pieces. So they were very clear and intentional about how things were to be organized in the context of the classroom, and they took ownership and agency of that. They tried turning the switch on, nothing worked. No batteries, his heart is not pumping. <laughs> Code red. So they then decided, and they problem solved, that it was the batteries that weren't working. So what do we do when we need to change batteries? Well, they needed a screwdriver. So what kind of screwdriver? So they had to problem solve about the perfect kind of screwdriver. And they had to go find that screwdriver. And it was the children then who were responsible for finding new batteries, getting the right kind and size of batteries, and taking the screws out and putting new batteries in. And voila, now Sharpie is working again. Sharky also encountered a problem on different formats of rugs. There was a plush rug in the classroom, and Sharky ended up getting stuck. 
So the children had to figure out how can we make a ramp or how can we get Sharky over the plush rug so they can move. So they problem solved using different materials to do that. There was times though that we had um, sort of uh, more teacher directed sort of kinds of learning experiences that were being introduced and that was one of these elements of making art with Cubetto. And the purpose of this lesson was, was focused on the idea of having children engage in a coding process for a desired outcome that the uh, technology would then create a piece of art together. But the art would be individualized based on how children decided to code the technology. And so they were going to go ahead in advance and they would write their codes. So they didn't just start off again throwing tiles in. It was an intentional writing process. So, so right here, this right. is this is the child working the, through the code where they're taking the tiles and they're actually drawing out the picture of the code in advance and then taking their picture and what they place on the page and putting it on the brain of the computer and going through the coding process. And for some children, they needed the more sort of tangible process of actually placing it into the board to help them then translate it onto the piece of paper. Um, others were then able to just sort of symbolically represent it as they went forward. And they wanted to um, add in different elements. So you can see this particular child, you have some components that are crossed out. And that's because to indicate the edits and changes that he was doing in his writing and drafting of the code. Because he realized that when he first did his initial draft, he didn't make space for what was called a function. The function was for the repetition of the code to go over again so that the uh, robot would repeat the actions. Um, and when he got done, he realized he hadn't left space so that could occur. So he crossed out to show, okay, I changed my mind. This isn't actually quite good. So again, so typical sort of writing and editing, right, type of process we see here. And he's making some corrections to that to then reflect his now new ways of thinking. And then once they were all together, then they had a chance to share with one another their codes so they can see that they all had sort of diverse ways of thinking about this. So here you have the, they're going through, they've had the experience writing code, now they're working together to read code, right? So we've got various forms of literacy that is, are taking place um, in their preparation of engaging Cubetto in the actual programming. And here we have a very large piece of paper so the children had a chance to go through, and I'll just show a little bit of this. So you can see as throughout the process, the children then had very unique representations and they were able to then showcase this and display. This is sort of the resulting sort of artwork that was done. They each labeled their own masterpiece that they did in collaboration with uh, Sharky and then the representations of their coding uh, were then around. So each, well. child's, each child's work is labeled with their name and then their associated code around the, side, around the outside. So, um, of course, you know, we have to keep um, sort of exploring opportunities with the children. So they then showed up at school one day, and now it was Sharky's turn to say that um, he was encountering an issue and needed help from them. And so this was the note that they found when they arrived. Hello, VPK, that's a voluntary pre-kindergarten is their class. I drew this picture from Ms. Tori, the director, but I don't know how to get to her office. Can you help me traveling from our classroom to her office? Thank you. That's it. That's all the guidance that they receive. It was up to the children to figure out how they were going to get through their classroom, which is down one area all the way to the director's office. This wasn't going to be sufficient to take one set of coding. It was going to be a collaborative effort of multiple sets of coding. And we're just going to end on showcasing um, a little bit of this experience of as they arrive at the classroom. Michael, is that point on that? So so the children could have had a variety of different options. They could have carried Cubetto there. They could have created code. And what you're going to see is the end result. So they all had taken turns with the various, but they had initially actually even problem solved how to get the picture attached to Cubetto. That was a, a whole effort unto itself. So this they was, used a lot of tape. Yes. <laughs> Um, so there's, there's lots of elements that, you know, obviously are sort of reflected in the children's learning, but these are sort of, again, sort of the key elements that we've been studying and exploring. One of the things that we've demonstrated is this idea of collaboration 
is that through this technology, the children sort of engaged in problem solving within the context of these shared spaces um, and really elevated their social interactions together. Critical thinking and problem solving. Um, so that every element um, sort of blended itself to this fostering of children's sort of active engagement about thinking in diverse ways and honoring sort of unique perspectives and approaches to how to solve issues. And even though the director sent them the note, it was very child-centric, child-directed. The children had to figure out how to get Sharpie to the director's office with their notes. And certainly, last but not least, no matter how children felt with regard to their own competency or efficacy with regard to technology itself, there's ways and approaches that they all can have a voice and an opportunity to engage in this process. So we're continuing to engage in this work, but we're glad to be able to share these elements with you and look forward to uh, sort of the next uh, conversations. Lovely, fantastic. Thank you very much. Um, while we're just switching over, um, are there any media questions from the floor that anybody would like to ask? No, perhaps as we switch over, can you tell us a little bit, the fantastic case study, can you tell us a little bit more about the context? Was that the first introduction that, that they had to coding itself? Can you better the first robot? Yeah, so in the context of this classroom, there are things like iPads, um, interactive tables, but they had not had any other prior experience with coding. Before the teachers actually had gone through and introduced it in the classroom, we had had several uh, learning experiences with them where they had gone through professional development and ongoing coaching with us about strategies and approaches of how to introduce it into the context of the classroom. But the representations that you saw here were the children's first. Uh, experiences and, and exploring this. This in, in the States is still very novel um, and so it, especially within our early years classrooms it hasn't sort of had its space and place um, in the same way I think throughout the EU that it's been represented. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. How, much, how, long, how much time the uh, children invest in this, in this particular project so before they were able to get a final phase to, to direct the robot to the yeah. So, so that took place over the course of a few weeks, and it just fit in to their existing curriculum. It became, so if you walked into the classroom after, after Cubetto or Sharky was introduced, he sat on the wall with the blocks, and periodically they would take Cubetto out, they start playing with him as part of a center, as part of just their natural activity. So it wasn't a series of lessons or, or integrated approaches, it was just a natural formation. The teacher originally introduced Kubeto to the classroom, and then after that, the children really took over in the planning. Lovely, thank you very much. I think we're now ready for Skulina um, from the University of Iceland. Welcome, Skulina. Thank you very much. Um, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about different practices from the north, mostly from Iceland. Is it on? Yeah, it is on. It's on there, yeah. Okay. Um, a little bit from Scandinavia because I've been lucky enough to go on the conference uh, on the Maypay project, which I also belong to, uh, to Denmark, and I've been in Finland as well. Uh, but first, a little bit maybe about myself. I work as an adjunct at the University of Iceland, and I've always been a maker and interested in technology ever since I was a kid. And uh, I completed the Fab Academy in 2015, but I'd never done any coding until then, and that sort of introduced me to that world. Although I had worked on computer games, I had uh, done it as an artist, so I don't really have a, a background in coding. But I thought it might be useful maybe to uh, give you an insight in our national curriculum, because I think uh, that the context that teachers work in does really uh, play into uh, when, you, when you're organizing uh, uh, new uh, entrants of uh, technologies. And our core curriculum has these six fundamental pillars that are sort of an intrinsic part of school activities in all curriculum guides and all school levels. And creativity is uh, one of them, and it makes it relatively easy for Icelandic teachers to argue for the uptake of creative practices. Um, 
Our main objective of literacy, uh, which was written, I think, approximately 10 years ago, uh, seems you know, still to be quite valid. And uh, it seems also to invite the use of various digital technologies and creative approaches of learning. Um, we have a very old sort of literacy uh, or, or liter literature tradition. So we have tended to be quite text-based, and the emphasis has been on the traditional sort of uh, definition of literacy. Uh, but uh, this one includes also a definition of media education, media literacy and digital literacy. But there's no mention of coding as a specific language of expression. But uh, nevertheless, coding has been practiced in some primary and secondary schools since 1985 and is now really gathering momentum. The universities that train teachers have also uh, provided some uh, training in ICT and coding practices for a number of years. But it has, however, not been mainstream, so it seems like now it's kicking in. Um, for the uh, preschool uh, children, tablets are now becoming uh, accessible and the preschool curriculum stresses that they should be used for wide-ranging creation of meaning. That's a reference uh, to the curriculum. So this brings a lot of possibilities and it can encourage teachers to experiment with coding. Uh, but with us, it's really left up to the professional uh, to decide whether they go this way or that way. And it's a bit similar to what they do in Finland. Uh, teachers are not really told to do, you know, certain, to teach certain books or to do certain uh, activities. It's up to them. Um, so coding is on the agenda in primary and lower secondary schools in relation to subject teaching in mathematics and ICT. And it's beginning to be introduced to some extent for all grades, but, but practices vary considerably and it can overlap in, in many fields. In, in preschools, uh, it seems like they're introducing various coding toys that can teach the basics of coding and the rule-based thought that goes into it. Uh, these toys introduce you know, the various aspects and allow children to experiment and create their own playful arrangements and stories. And this I've seen sort of out, out in the field that uh, they, when they sort of have learned the basic uh, coding practices, then they start to add, they connect to their own lives and they create stories around uh, the coding that they're doing. Yeah. Yeah. Like I watched this group uh, yeah. doing some uh, robotics and you know, within half an hour they had created some hey, stories about what they were doing. and they also used iMovie. Um, I think the introduction of uh, the playful element of coding is encouraging for many learners. And games such as this one by an Icelandic company, Radiant Games, is called Block, uh, Block, uh, Box Island, has been uh, uh, quite popular at home and uh, not just in Iceland but also worldwide when it became introduced uh, to the hour of code. And this is a, a, a program that we have um, taken part in and uh, more and more schools seem to uh, go into it every year. Um, some schools have introduced the method of, that older students help the younger ones and they also cope in teams. 
Uh, so uh, it's also for, uh, being facilitated by the implementation of iPads in some communities. So like if whole communities decide to implement an iPad, then it changes the scenery in schools drastically because uh, it's not just happening on one, com one teacher's computer it's, or in a, a computer lab. They go all over the school coding, like in the, the our code, and have fun with it. Um, we have, uh, we've had, for some years, we've had the, the Icelandic Young Inventors Competition. I think it started in the 90s. And this was like a forerunner because it has a, a making element in it. So some uh, projects that were done within it uh, had coding elements. But then, more recently, we have had this annual computing contest of the compulsory schools that uh, quite many students take part in, and it's free of charge and open to everyone. And this help is helping also to bring attention to coding and to showcase some good projects. Uh, I thought I'd mention uh, there are some movements in Scandinavia, like the coding pirates. Uh, they are a national association that is run like a not-for-profit uh, to introduce digital technologies and to make things. And they do many other things other than coding, 3D printing and uh, uh, gaming, uh, making of games with uh, Game Maker and Unity, if you know these uh, programs. But they also teach coding and they have valuables like coding kits that uh, the kids can use. And this is working quite well. It works a lot on, on a, like a voluntary basis. So young uh, students from the university, teacher trainees, or others, they keep uh, give these workshops. Um, we have experienced back home uh, some special coding efforts uh, lately. Uh, there was a, a state effort in 2016 to teach coding in primary school. And the Minister of Education, he sent out 10,000 uh, sets of microbits. Uh, and uh, in collaboration with the National Directorate of Education and the uh, State Broadcasting Corporation, they put together a program, a uh, web-based program, uh, to uh, introduce this. Uh, there has no evaluation been carried out to date, uh, but we've had sort of uh, Rumors that uh, because it was lacking in teacher training, it didn't take off as fast as it should have. Uh, and I think this is actually uh, one of the main sort of hindrances for introducing coding into schools that uh, uh, teachers are not giving enough uh, possibilities to retrain and to learn how to work in this way because it's quite different from, especially if uh, you're long into your career. Um, we have also had uh, some learning companies appearing on the scene. Uh, uh, those two that I mentioned here are both connected to this uh, coding uh, sort of uh, revolution, I would call it, maybe. Um, and uh, both of the founders are women, uh, interestingly enough. And the one on the left, Schema, is, is completely based on coding actions. And, uh, and they run different courses and they run also a, a, a girl a tech academy, which I'm going to show you a little bit about. Uh, we have a, a fund that is, has been put up, it's called the Quotas of the Future. And it's been established actually to train teachers and to develop coding practices in different schools. So I think, I mean, these programs are quite valuable because they, they're not just teaching coding, they're also creating a social change, if you like. Um, and this is really needed uh, to at least to start things off. So this is, seems to be the way that uh, we are heading. Uh, the curriculum is now 10 years old, so maybe someone will decide to uh, reevaluate it and change it. But, uh, in my view, I think the teachers are, are, are sort of ahead. They are spearheading uh, some interesting uh, development. And I decided to finish off with this uh, visual uh, uh, quote from uh, a young Icelandic teacher who is uh, in his 30s. And he was recently chosen as one of the 100 most influential, influential educators. 
in the 100 Ed project. Um, he's not keen on streamlining students' learning or PISA and standardized testing, and he wants to encourage students to uh, solve real problems by asking what matters, as, in, as he has said. And I think his actions and others that share his view are likely to be influential in the coming years. And uh, it indicates to me that uh, the professional views of teachers need to be heard and actively considered when it comes to curriculum development and educational policy. He and others will be pressing on for coding and various other digital technologies so that they can be used in personalized learning in schools in the coming years. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Julian. Um, does anybody have any media questions? Has there been a clarification or no? Yeah, in which case, yeah, oh, Karen, yeah. Um, just while we're swapping over and getting the, the slide up a bit more about my slide. Um, I'm just wondering, can I get a show of hands from the from you, the audience? How many of you are actually early years educators working in a, within a practice at the moment? Teacher you are researchers, teacher educators. You are all teacher educator researchers. No. Some some just researchers in different areas of early childhood and okay. digital literacy, yeah. So it's a university-based researchers. Alright, great. You're going to get my presentation. <laughs> okay, lovely. Karen Mercier um, from Curtin University. Uh, thank you very much, first of all, for uh, allowing me to, to join with you and to be able to share our practice or some of our practice uh, from Australia. I'm actually from the west coast of Australia, from Perth, and as you can see from my cover slide there, from Curtin University. Now, a little bit about my background, and then I'll tell you a little bit about the, uh, the context around digital technologies in early childhood in Australia. Uh, first of all, I actually started out my career as a science and maths teacher, but very quickly, that seems, seems a million years ago, over 30 years ago, I uh, very quickly moved into um, university and research. And the direction that my work has actually taken is how can technologies, or in fact digital education technologies, enhance the learning experience of students? So I've been very much critical in my thinking and approach to understanding what are the affordances offered by a technology for a child's learning? So I guess to cut to the chase of that, why are we doing it? Why do we bring digital technologies into the classroom? If it's not about enhancing learning opportunities for the children, then why bother? Because often the technology can be problematic in itself. It's great when it works and it's frustrating when it doesn't. So the question that underpins the research that we're doing, and you'll see evident in what um, I'm presenting the slides today, is really to be critically reflective. Why are we doing what we're doing? And how is it enhancing uh, children's learning? Okay, so in Australia, a little bit about the context. We have a fairly new national curriculum for technologies, and it's divided into two pillars. One is about the making and the design, aspect of technologies and the second pillar is digital technologies and as you would expect coding is, pre is a predominant feature of what is described as outcomes through that national curriculum in digital, digital technologies. Now that curriculum goes from um, pre-primary, the year before entry into formal schooling, through to year 12. We don't have a formal curriculum for kindergarten all four early years learning from zero through to four or five years of age. What we do have from our state governments is um, a, a um, guidelines framework. So in early childhood, there's currently a um, pushback against curriculum. 
Um, in Australia, there is a high priority on the importance of children's play and the play and the learning and development that is achieved through and as children play. So early childhood educators are not keen to have an Australian or a state curriculum outcomes pushed into what they see as being a very important time where children play and learn through their play. Yet we have an early years learning framework which is a philosophy of early childhood education that encourages teachers to be intentional in their practice. So the question about what does it mean to be intentional as an educator when the child sits at the centre of the learning experience and it is an emergent curriculum that comes from the interests in play is very much debated. And then in that space, why are we bringing digital technologies? And is it always, or is it, in the best interests of children's development and the development of those social skills and transversal competencies that the person spoke about earlier? So that's the background and a little bit about the context of what's happening in Australia, which will help frame uh, the focus that I've taken in this presentation. So I wanted to start out by um, putting, being explicit about two assumptions that underpin the work that I'm doing with educators. And firstly is that intentional planning or the intentional introduction of resources into a learning environment in response to a child's um, interest and the emergent or driven curriculum can enrich the learning experience and be holistic in nature um, and help to pull together and integrate aspects of the learning that children experience. Sitting at the core of this is that the, the idea or the assertion that learning experiences for children are hands-on, their minds on, but they're also hearts on as well. The best learning and, and provocative learning for children comes when they hear that it's a real world point of interest that they choose to explore using whatever the, um, the resource is that gives the affordances they need or the tools for that inquiry. So bringing the um, Cubeto, the VBOX and even iPads into the early years learning centre was in fact an experiment. And it was driven by the educators and the, the people in the centre, uh, the educators and the director of the centre themselves because they were personally challenged with what technologies should we be bringing into the centre, should we bring them in at all, and if we do, how should we introduce them, and what sort of strategies uh, will get the most with children's experience with them. So the aim of this particular research project that I'm going to unpack for you was we were interested in how do early childhood educators engage young children, and the children in this project were between the ages of three and five. Um, how do they engage with tangible coding technologies such as Cubeto, Bebop and iPads? But importantly, how do the young children themselves code creatively with tangible technologies when they're in the environment? So we had that two-pronged approach and view of what we were doing. What were the teachers doing and, how, and what were the children doing? So the intentionality of teachers' action but the play and the, the expressions of knowledge and understanding and development growth that we observed amongst the children. So as I said, it was a bit of an experiment. So the educators were positioned in this project with us as partners or research practitioners. Um, and we were literally interested in what's so special about Cubeta? Is it special? Is it different? Beanbots, it's also got a tangible coding interface. It's got mechanical buttons that the children can press to code, so it's touch <coughs> and concrete. Yet, children are experiencing iPads every day. So, is that going to be the, you know, have the affordances that the children need to use it as a tool for exploration and acquiring the learning environment? So, that's the choice of the three technologies. But, in fact, through this presentation, I'm going to focus in on just Cubeto so I can illustrate for you some of the learnings that came out of this and how we are now theoretically framing our research uh, going forward. So as I said, this was an initial case study research 
with one Early Years Learning Centre. Now, the Early Years Learning Centre is our Curtin University um, Early Years Centre, which provides long daycare and the kindergarten program from children from the age of zero, eight weeks, I think is the youngest child in the centre, uh, through to the three and four year olds in the kindergarten program. There were four educators working with me as a practitioner researcher, as a partner in the research. Now, interestingly, in Australia, I think we are um, a little bit, we have ground to move up. It is only in the last few years that we have required a fully qualified educator to lead a, a room in an early years learning centre. Prior to that, a TAFE or a technical um, diploma, a CERT 3 and CERT 4, was sufficient to actually lead um, education in an early years centre. However, nationally legislated, that has now changed. So my educators that I'm working with, one of them actually had a master's degree from New Zealand, uh, two of them were bachelor degree trained, and the fourth had a cert four or a diploma in um, early years care and education. So these educators uh, chose to work with focus groups of children because they were actually collecting data and evidence. So the project and the availability of the technologies, of course, sat across all of the rooms for all of the children but they only collected um, actual data and photographs and did the reflective practice around the focused children because of the ethics involved. Ethics in early childhood research in Australia is stringent, as I would expect in other countries as well. Um, so to have consent, informed consent from parents and the young children themselves to have their photographs taken and to be the focus of reflection and analysis is actually taken very seriously. So for that reason, we were contained to a focus group of three or four children per room, and also to get the depth of understanding and evidence that we were looking for. So action research methods framed the way we worked with the teachers. Uh, they would literally have plan for an investigation themselves, an inquiry for themselves, and they would put the actions into practice with, the, with the classroom, that might be the introduction of a resource, it might be an inquiry questioning technique that they wanted to try out, um, and so on. So it was planned, then they acted on it, they captured evidence in terms of photographs and kept a digital uh, diary of the photographs and their reflections. They also used the Harvard Visible Thinking Strategy to get depth in their, their reflection. I see, I think, I wonder. And we had talking circles and debriefing to actually draw all that data and, and evidence together. So as you saw with the bursts, Cubeta was introduced to the children, um, first of all, to become familiar with the technology itself. And it was a little bit of a free play exploration. Cubeta very much did, did become a friend. And the focus was around how do you talk to Cubeta and listening to him. And he makes a little when you turn it on. And the children said, that's Cubetto saying hello, and this is how he talks to us. So it then became much of a conversation about how do we communicate with Cubetto and the introduction of the coding board itself. So out of that initial free play um, went on, the first cycle of action was two weeks long. There was all sorts of things that came out of that practice. Children were learning about patterns, sequencing, importantly cause and effect. If I put this code and this block in place, then Cubeta responds in this way. And we actually watched the children do problem deconstruction. I need Cubeta to go from here and then over to there. Now, their language um, is not as involved, obviously, and it's very appropriate for a child who's three and four years old. But it was amazing to watch them. Watch the children's eyes and you could actually see what little minds ticking over and the deconstruction of the pathways, you can actually watch their eyes going here and here, and some children are actually physically stepping out one, two, because of the coding maps that are associated with the toys. Right, I'm trying to hurry it up. Um, so from this, there were so many inquiry questions that the children came up with. Let's make, because um, one of the maps that comes with Cubeto is of space, outer space, and has objects and symbols and representations of outer space. The children were saying things like, I want to make a rocket so we can fly to outer space. 
converter can actually slide out of space. So that became a big construction project. There was lots of alfoil and glue, and we even had some paper mache happening, and so on. And interestingly, the centre had an art exhibition. The university has a gallery that actually had an exhibition of art from early years, from the early years, the learning centre. And Cubetto and Bebox featured quite heavily uh, in the art that was um, displayed. And you can see some of the, in that bottom corner, some of the children's space creations that came out of this work with Cubetto. They were also very concerned about Cubetto because he got stuck in a box at the end of the day. And he had no, and he, they wanted him to have a friend. So the groups of children were then working out how they could make a friend for Cubetto. And as we saw with the Bersons project, it then came, where does he get his energy from? And how come he's a bit tired today? And so on and so on. And so you can see the inquiry questioning, questions building, and the children's many investigations grew from that. What I do want to focus on is the fascination that the children had about planets that were on the, the coding map. They wanted to know what it was like on other planets. So as an educator, I go, hmm, shouldn't the children be finding out about where they live first and their room and their home and their environment? Maybe some research would suggest that. But the children wanted to know about the planets in outer space. They wanted to know what it would be like there if Cubetto got in his spaceship and went to the other planets, what would it be like? Would he be okay? So they ended up deciding uh, to make a play map actually with the um, planets themselves. So this came after a cycle of action where they were using iPads, looking at pictures of the different planets, um, and talking to the teacher about the different planets. Um, the teacher introduced drawing materials, paper, so that they could represent what they were learning and what they thought things looked like on the other planets and so on. So with their educator, they then took those pictures and made them into a play map which was a way for Kibieto to explore all the different um, um, planets that they found. So it was their representation of the solar system through these drawings and maps. Um, now, as you this is the, the map that they had made, um, and you can see some pictures that came from the internet and so on. But a huge part of this task was mathematical. How big does each tile have to be? How far does Cubetto go with each coded movement? So there was a lot of mathematics that was embedded into the children's um, exploration and creation of these maps. But at the same time, it was a very rich um, oral language sessions that sat around this, the imagination and the creativity and the storytelling uh, that came from the, the children um, was, was quite amazing. Now, because this was a research project and we were looking for evidence, it was an intention, it was intentional. We decided to introduce a strategy called storyboarding. So it was a way for the children to capture the stories that they were creating and to represent them in a non-verbal, non, non pre-literacy type way. So it was very symbolic in terms of the way the children represented what they did. So you can see an example there, on the right page number, um, of the um, storyboarding that the children did. But this is a great example here where the children actually were retelling the story and sharing their stories with the other children who could then code, use the coding that was represented on the storyboard and note, as with the bursts, the colours and the shapes that represented the sequencing and the patterns of the coding. Um, but there was a story that sat behind this and they shared the stories with each other and their child out. And you can actually see this child is coding um, to take Humetto to Venus. So it's not his story, it's his friend's story. So it's the reading somebody else's what came out of this was wow it's amazing what children can actually do and understand and I was intrigued to read later a report from Scientific America stating that children can code before they can read and I thought yeah you bet you can so the sorts of things that were sitting embedded in the experiences of the children from a coding perspective were sequencing, identifying patterns, number awareness, and computational thinking. 
arguably, the kids have been coding, it's been in the curriculum forever, okay? Because mathematicians will say coding is maths. So you will see that the early years capabilities underpinning coding are actually mathematical capabilities. We also saw the children, it provided an opportunity to develop those key mathematical capabilities. One-to-one -one correspondence, pointing and connecting, number names to movements and positions. Um, they were also using the language of location and orientation, directional language, and we saw them using the non-standard um, units. How far is Cubato going to go? Is it this far? And using pieces of cardboard and so on to, to measure in non-standard ways. Um, we also saw uh, a lot of those um, transversal competencies evident in the children's play. That rich communication and collaboration between the children, ownership of the learning that they're engaged with, and some control in the direction that it took. Uh, risk taking, trial and error, inquiry, problem solving, were all evident in the work that the children did. So from a, a theoretical perspective, how do we actually move the research forward and provide and find the evidence for what is a good technology to bring into early years um, environments and why would you do it? We drew on and are continuing to draw on, draw on um, semiotic resources in the work of Kress and Van Leeuwen from 2001. So this is really about multimodality and the importance of that in learning pr uh, processes. Many of you, if you work in the areas of early years education, would be aware of 1990 work from Bruna, which talked about stages of learning, and that children will actually go through, or learning goes through stages of inactive, where it's very concrete, hands-on and manipulative, to iconic, where you close your eyes and you can see it, you can imagine it, that mind's eyes, and that modelling and representation, to the symbolic. Words are a symbol of an experience or a phenomenon, and the, um, the, the symbols of the social conventions around direction and so on. And we saw all three of these elements present in the work that the children were doing. So we're now talking about and looking at getting evidence to see the coordination of the children's modes of representation in their learning of coding through this play-based, holistic, and really rich experiences for the children. So my question, that I have because good researchers don't have all the answers, otherwise we would all be going home. Mm -hmm. um, the question is, does the children's learning go through a progression from inactive to iconic to symbolic modes of representation as they develop these coding capabilities? Um, there is research in higher areas, um, higher areas, older age groups of children that documents learning sequences and the importance of having a representational sequence aligned to Bruno's work to enhance the children's learning of abstract concepts. Um, we previously ran an Australian Research Council project looking at how um, year four children, or eight, nine year olds, um, understand night and day and the other astronomy concepts, which are very abstract. So the importance of the sequence of the representation and the re-representations that children go through as they learn these abstract um, concepts. So a proposition going forward is that maybe we actually need to be mindful of these, uh, these aspects of learning when we decide what sort of technologies we bring into an early years learning environment. What's age appropriate? What are the design features of a technology that make it age appropriate? And then what strategies do educators, educators what strategies do educators use to support children's play-based inquiry learning um, that is again age appropriate and provides the outcomes that we're all striving to achieve. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, Karen. Um, I'm now going to suggest that we take maybe between five and ten minutes. Um, to throw it back out to you to discuss before we um, give it back to the panel um, to ask any questions. Um, thank you very much. Fascinating insights from all four speakers there. 
Um, I wonder if you might think about um, perhaps any general questions you have for either of the speakers, any of the three uh, presentations you've heard this morning. Um, Jackie mentioned that we've had over 20 countries represented 30, here. 30. Over 30 countries, wow. Um, so you might want to have a think about how some of these ideas relate to the situation in your own countries, and um, possibly even Karen's uh, proposition at the end about how we make these decisions about what technology um, we put out there. So five or ten minutes, um, and then if I could invite the speakers um, to answer any questions that you have. Okay, well, we have lots of questions here. Let's start with you, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. I'd like to ask the panel whether you think that the very exciting work that you've done leads to a reshaping of the entire curriculum from its kind of Western post-industrialist um, shape, which traditionally had sort of mass and STEM subjects at one end, and things connected with in arts and embodiment, indeed, as kind of positioned in completely different uh, areas, perhaps as more trivial. It seems to me that what you're showing is really exciting work that, that brings um, maths, embodiments, and art and creativity, including artistic creativity, to, together in ways that must, must challenge the curriculum. Who wants to respond? So, so one of our, um, our philosophical underpinnings is this sense of an integrated curriculum. And we were just talking, and your question is really timely, we were just having that exact conversation up here, is, is that the innovation is going to change. Next year it could be something else, the year after that it could be something else. But this integrated approach, Eileen and I always teach, we teach, um, I teach a course in uh, methodologies for elementary age um, teachers. And Eileen teaches an early childhood approach to social science education. And we always talk about that when students go about their daily lives in, in schools, they don't necessarily go and say, I'm going to put on my science hat or my math hat and then go to social studies. They think in integrated fashions. So the way that we're thinking about this and the way that we're conceptualizing this is a strong emphasis on this integrated daily life in my world, in my sense of being. And I mean, I would just sort of say, um, as an early childhood educator, um, we've long held sort of the framework that learning is interdisciplinary, that we don't um, believe in that sort of separation. And so we're staying true to those values as we enact this body of work. But that has been a very strong counter movement to the way the educational systems have been arranged outside of that early childhood context, right, which are, are very content specific. Um, so we, we definitely see that happening in our early childhood space, but for a long time we've had much greater latitude and flexibility um, within that, that sort of shifting in the states right now um, as accountability metrics sort of then extrapolate downward, unfortunately. So we're still trying to hold strong in that area, but um, I think this is one of those things we're hoping that we can document and demonstrate um, these things. But I'll say, you know, it's interesting as a researcher, though, so, you know, we, we go after our, you know, federal funding, you know, with our NSF or IES, and, you know, sort of our holy grail of funding. We still have to, though, put it under a domain-specific sort of category, which is uh, sort of an interesting dynamic. So the representations of our research still very much seem to get sort of segmented. Um, just because that's why they, how the existing structures sort of frame our body of work. Um, so that, that's probably, it'll take a while till we see those remnants sort of diffuse in that way. Um, just, just to add to that, um, I'm actually a STEM specialist um, by whatever that acronym really means. Um, there's a STEM agenda in Australia, so there is significant funding being directed into STEM education initiatives. So STEM is, um, you know, more than an acronym, and it highlights the integrated nature of science, technology, engineering, and mathematics in problem solving and, and, and everyday um, issues that we are facing as a country and, and globally. Um, so my, my background as a researcher actually comes out of scientific literacy and numeracy demands across the curriculum. So for me it's a very natural movement to go into what is now a STEM agenda because for me it was, that's just the way it is. 
you know, that's the real life and reality of the place of science, technology, engineering and maths in everything that we do. Um, so for me, 30 years down the track as an educator and a researcher, I'm delighted to see that the Australian Government is recognising the integrated and holistic nature of STEM and its place in education. Also, the transversal competencies that sit within STEM. Creativity doesn't belong to the arts. Try telling Einstein that he wasn't creative, um, or any of our other great mathematicians that they derived their solutions in a linear and logical manner. No, it's creative, it's innovation, it's risk taking. Um, so even the true nature of the STEM disciplines in their siloed you know, pots, if you like, um, is much richer and engaged and holistic than the way textbooks perhaps have represented it over the years. Thank you. Jackie, do we have another question? Yeah. Um, and I'm so glad to see a discussion on the table rather than my own specific question, but we just, uh, so we have Bulgaria, Croatia, and Malta, and UK represented on our table. We just um, had questions about the um, in each of those different contexts, there are different resources, there are different um, ratios of staff to student, um, and we were, we were seeing, you know, obviously very different curriculum, uh, seeing some of the sort of challenges, and we wanted if the panel could address some of those, of doing some of this work in uh, settings that, that maybe have, you know, lower, lower levels of resourcing and, and lower opportunity uh, ratios of, of staff. Um, we, we can go ahead and uh, start. It, it's an excellent question, and actually, that's a core question that we have right now. So, the laboratory school setting that we were featuring is on our campus, although we serve children. Um, so, the first uh, locus is within the context of our university community that means students, and staff, and faculty. Um, we also do serve the community, but uh, it, it's definitely a very privileged environment with regard to resources and educators and the supports that are there. So the next um, sort of work that we've been engaging in is about sort of diffusion of these models of pedagogy into our community context of our school. So our school district and our local community is the eighth largest in the United States. It serves over 200,000 students that speak about 165 different languages um, and um, very many of the schools serve very impoverished communities. So we are working um, in collaboration with both our Head Start um, centers, which are specifically uh, for families um, who are from under-resourced communities, um, and exploring sort of the interaction and engagements of the tangible technologies into the settings. That is a big, big project. Um, and part of it is our challenge is not about sort of the readiness and interest of the educators themselves. It is the fact that within many of those learning environments, the curriculum has been much more structured and, um, and done in such a way that it's scripted and making little space and room for the kind of innovative and creative uh, engagement of the children. Um, so, so we're countering against sort of pressures that exceed those systems um, at play. Uh, but, but that is actually the, the focus of all of the work that we're doing now going forward with funding and resource allocation and um, training and preparation is about bringing that into our community at large as part of our learning experiences. But we recognize um, it, it is with a lot of challenges um, that we're facing that. Um, I just want to respond a little bit to Julia's questions because I think it's really cool. I mean, we have a, a situation with the curriculum where we've had the art and vocational uh, subjects being like 50% of the curriculum. We've never sort of uh, made them disappear as has been in some countries. So with us, it's more like a holistic sort of uh, vision for uh, uh, the new technologies and uh, coding. And so that, um, like, we've had thematic teaching since the 70s, 
And even if we have a, like a schedule um, from a reference curriculum, we still make time for these uh, thematic, maybe thematic week. Uh, our course <coughs> takes a whole day where you can deal with uh, subjects so holistically. So I would say that you know, the emphasis is more on steam than STEM with us. Um, although saying that for the Scandinavian countries, there has been a tendency, uh, especially in Denmark uh, and Sweden, to remove the, uh, sort of the art and crafts discipline or, or sideline them. But uh, when I was in Denmark, uh, uh, where I came from now, they're planning to introduce them again in, in the curriculum in the autumn, so to, to uh, maybe to enable more a holistic approach. Um, so if we talk about you know the system itself in Iceland, we have a state school, so to speak, but it's run by a local council. So the facilities are really up to you know the uh, the abilities of the different uh, uh, sort of councils and. And some of them are really small, they don't maybe afford to bring out all these new technologies when the, the big ones do. So there is a difference there that uh, comes about because of uh, uh, the sort of situation between the cities and the rural uh, countryside. Mm -hmm. So maybe that would be the case in other countries as well, I guess. But, uh, but clearly the uh, emphasis is teacher led uh, to bring new technologies, although we have this. Uh, uh, sort of neoliberalist sort of agenda uh, echoing in society, in the media, uh, pushing government to uh, introduce new technologies, to uh, sort of introduce 21st century skills. It's all there. So it's like a complicated mix of, of uh, issues in the discussion that I think teachers have to deal with all the time. And it's one sort of course of strain. And, People back home, or the teachers back home, they talk a lot about being under, you know, more pressure than ever because of uh, uh, multiculturalism, inclusion, and new technologies. It's sort of all ganging up on them, really. <laughs> Thank you, Skilina. I think we do have time for one more question. There was one just at the front. I'm uh, Esther Sharon and Gary, and I represent the parents here. So you probably will not be surprised that my question is about um, how do you interact with the parents when it comes to these technologies. Um, well, especially in Europe, um, there are very strong movements to uh, ban technology. Uh, unfortunately, well, I, I like the Steiner Waldorf, some of the Steiner Waldorf principles, but not their idea of no technology until the age of 12. And we somehow have to um, deliver it to the parents so that they understand that this is not harmful, well, it's it's really good. And I was also wondering how we as Europeans can, can probably link whatever was there presented to the work that we're doing for the Neville Foundation on promoting learning through play. Um, in the, your presentation, the first presentation, you actually had four of the five characteristics that were uh, developed as learning through play that is very easily translated into 21st century learning. The missing element was joy, but if you watch the videos, uh, the joy was there. So if you add that as a fifth category, then you are at the same point where we have been with the Foundation for a long time. Uh, it's interesting, going back to um, a point made earlier, we, we were sitting here talking about technologies will come and go. Um, and if there's one thing that is certain, and that is that change will happen. So it's not so much, I think, basing it on a particular technology, but understanding the affordances and capabilities um, given by the technologies in the, in the children's learning. Um, but absolutely, there's some the role of parents is, is integral because they they are the child's first educator and they are a key person in anything that happens in those early years and it's a three-way learning partnership with any educator, uh, with the, the child, the educator and of course the parent. Um, so how do we message to parents about the affordances offered by technology um, and put in a, some guidelines perhaps Somebody said to me the other day about any new movement in education should come with a consumer's guide. 
these are the pros and these are the cons. Because no matter what we do, and we emphasise an aspect within the learning, we'll lose something else. This is only so many hours of the learning program. So I think it's working with parents as to what are appropriate technologies for young children, what strategies are important for parents, and, and providing them with advice around how they work with and engage their children, um, children with technologies. Communication strategies in the early years centres. You would have seen, um, I hope you noticed on the photos, uh, the, the centre that I work with, with this research, has floor books, these big, you know, A, A through the blank books, and the children draw in them, they translate children's discussions into those books, um, they stick in pictures, they take photos and so on. And these are shared with the parents. They have um, um, easels at the uh, entry to the room to <coughs> help facilitate that conversation with parents. And the parents are provided with the detailed learning stories about what the children have engaged with um, during the day. And they receive, I think every child receives four a term. So that would be, you know, th uh, sort of approximately 12 a year of these detailed stories about their, their child's learning. So communicating with parents is critical and recognising the importance of those three-way learning partnerships is certainly a priority from what I've seen with practitioners in Australia. Um, I just want to um, sort of mention um, one of the challenges we've had in the States that you may be aware of is though when those entities that are to be in the service of helping families become more informed and engaged don't quite get it right. So we have that situation, for example, with the American Pediatric Association um, sort of dictates of time dimensions um, for exposure to screen without understanding the differentiation between active versus passive screen exposure. Um, so created sort of mass panic and then a counter movement throughout the states around screen free environments because of the evils in general of any screen device. I mean, it sort of led us to be very intentional in our own research and work. I mean, Cubetto is screen free. Um, so that we sort of made a thoughtful decision about utilizing um, that technology, not just because we thought it had the developmental affordances that met within our early childhood context, but it also saved us from having to bring in yet another screen device into a setting and then trying to sort of make sense of those elements um, when our external entities um, are using metrics and measurements about how much time children are sitting in front of a screen in any capacity at all. Um, so so we, we do have a lot of mixed communication that's coming to families. So in our own context, again, in the lab school, um, family involvement and family engagement are core principles. Um, so both before we're introducing new elements um, and throughout, uh, and parents are key partners in that process. Um, we share with them, we invite them in continuously, we invite questions, and, um, and they take an active role um, in our implementation and engagement in all of our work that we're doing. So um, they're really critical and key to this, and. Um, as much as we spend time in educating our teachers on how to utilize these resources, we spend as much time with families about understanding the implications for homeschool communication and connections that they can make as well. So, so one of the uh, one of the key elements we didn't have enough time to share with you today, but we, we have brought examples are those homeschool connection documentation reports. So we have some examples that we be willing to share and show you when we're communicating with families. Also, you can see that the technology is not necessarily privileged. For the sake of this demonstration, of course, we were highlighting coding, but you saw geographic literacy skills. I mean, how many how many times have, have all of us used our Google Maps, but you saw an old school map on the floor where the kids were engaged in exploration about where are you from. So we're bringing in a lot of different types of literacy skills. We're focusing on civic literacy skills as well cooperation, collaboration, being a friend, sharing. So the technology becomes a tool in our communication, a part of the communication with parents, but not the, it's not being privileged in our examples. Okay, I think we'll need to uh, wind that up. Um, the next session will be at half past, that's Stefan Lowell.
about 25 to us. About 25 to so we've got a full half hour of coffee. Um, if I could just take the opportunity to thank our panel once more.